Have you seen This Is Us? How many of you have? How many of you watch it? Okay, you watch it. All right, so you know a little bit about, about the hottest show on TV. Now, everybody that doesn't, it's okay. We're gonna convert you by the time this series is over. <laughs> it's okay, you'll be able to, to, to go along. But it's a, the story of a family called the Pearson family, and uh, it's actually the story of all of us. Uh, we, we, you relate to different pieces of what's going on. some of the best writing that I've ever seen. Uh, but it's also a show that's responsible for the increase in the value of Kleenex. Um, <laughs> you cry every week. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's re- responsible for a mass sell-off of crockpots, and you'll have to watch the show <laughs> in order to kind of get that. Now, we know that not, not everybody has seen the show, and so I wanted to play just a short video clip that'll give you a kind of a feeling of what it's like. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. Sweetheart, go get the ball, hon. Switch. Switch. Is that a French braid? Yeah. I know how complicated this delivery could get. Well, I'm going to need everyone in this room to believe me when I say that only good things are going to happen here today. I want you to know it. I found him. My father. 36 years ago, you left me at the front door of a fire station. I'm your biological son. If you think I'm gonna forgive you... I don't. You wanna meet your grandchildren? He is looking good. He's <laughs> not right. Your wife is in distress, Jack. Do you remember what Dad used to say? There's no lemon so... Sour. But you can't make something resemble lemonade. When I won't give up. This is William. He left me at a fire station and I invited him into our home. <laughs> Go see your babies. They're excited to meet their father. I think maybe they got a good one. Rough, I'm giving you all my love. Of a show that has Jason Mraz singing, you know, and it's great. So, so why are we doing a series, This Is Us? Because we can. <laughs> it's my favorite show. In fact, We came, we came, I was, last weekend I was speaking in Richmond, Virginia at one of the churches we planted there three years ago. They had their third anniversary. They had over 800 people on their third anniversary. Just incredible. And I, they wanted me to stay and speak to the staff. And I said, no, I've got to get home for a Super Bowl party. And actually it was This Is Us that I wanted to see. Those of you <laughs> know about that. And uh, we had a flight booked and everything. Wouldn't you know, canceled the flight, all kind of stuff. I had to drive, they drove me to Washington, D.C. in order to get back, and I got back uh, sometime in the second half. We went over to some friend's house to watch the second half of the Super Bowl, and uh, then we got home, and, and I, I said, Deb, uh, you know, it's like 11.30 or something. I said, I'm gonna make an admission here. Okay, we, um, don't judge me. We, we, have, we have a couple of TVs, one in the living room, one in the bedroom. Some of you don't have TVs in your bedroom, God bless you, we do, okay? And so I said, I said, uh, let's, let's go to bed, we'll watch it from there. And she said, well, no, she said, uh, I won't be able to stay awake. And I said, well, okay, you watch it in the living room, I'll watch it in here. So I was in there, and after it was over, she came in and she said, was that, were you sniffling in here? That, I couldn't hardly hear the TV. And so I've lost my man card, and I don't care. <laughs> so we're gonna do a three-week series, and this is what's gonna be fun is it's going to allow us to approach some issues that we don't normally get to talk about on the weekend here. And so we're gonna let the show kind of drive us in that direction. And uh, along those lines, uh, today uh, we're going to, uh, we're also gonna, it's gonna be a fun way to bring biblical truth to bear on contemporary issues. I think you're gonna like that. Um, So let's dive in. This week we're gonna talk about families Specifically, dysfunctional families. Okay, so question. How many of you are currently in or grew up in a dysfunctional family? Just raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, last night, <clears throat> last night, some of you were like, so quick, you know? Like, whoa, yeah, like that. Uh, last night, my son Joshua was sitting right here on the front row, and he had his way up like this. My dad was on the back row. I had mine up, you know? 
The truth is, we're all dysfunctional. Some of you bring the fun back into dysfunctional. But it's called, it's called sin. It's called sin. We're, we're in a fallen world, and uh, we're all dysfunctional. I don't think, and I'll talk to you about this in a minute, that there are functional families. I, I don't think, I, I think there are families that work, but there's, there's, if functional is the opposite of dysfunctional, I, we're, we're all dysfunctional. Um, so it, signs you may have grown up in a dysfunctional family uh, is your parents always found new ways to have fun with you. This guy, she's got a rope tied around her leg and he's got it right here in a little adult beverage right there. <laughs> That's dysfunctional. Um, how about this? Your parents weren't afraid to try out alternative methods of discipline. It says our get along shirt. She's real happy about that. And uh, I wouldn't do that, that's dysfunctional. How about this one? Every time you try to take a nice picture, something like this would happen. I don't know if you can see it, but here's dad in the background. And he's got his shirt off. And I don't think it was an accident because he's grinning like a canary, okay? Or your backyard may have looked like that. That's dysfunctional, okay? So, so anyway, families, families aren't dysfunctional because you have problems. We all have problems. Their dysfunction comes from not doing anything about it. And today what I'm gonna do is I've titled the message The Five Dysfunctions of a Family. There's a business book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Great book, I'd recommend it if you're in business. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I just thought it was a cool title. Some of you are uh, psychologists. I know there are several that are here in the church. And you'll say, how do you narrow it down to five? Because if you look at lists, there's like seven, there's eight, there's 10, there's 16. So I'm not, I'm not saying that we've got them all, but what, what I've tried to do is kind of get some categories that I think impact here and some biblical things that we can see and probably will impact most of us. And what I want you to do is I want you to kind of come alongside in your family. Uh, we'll look at the Pearsons, we'll look at a biblical family, and then we're gonna look at our family. Just to set up the Pearsons real quick, uh, Jack Pearson is the father, he's absolutely perfect. I watch the show in order to feel guilty about being a father every Tuesday night, because he's so sensitive and he always says the right thing. And uh, he dies tragically. Uh, and 20 years later, the family's still trying to come to grips with uh, what happened. And uh, there's three kids, Randall, Kate, and Kevin. And uh, Ke Kevin is uh, probably the one that you would vote most likely to succeed, athlete, actor, but his life has melted down into a series of addictions. He checks into a rehab center. They all live in separate parts of the United States, very seldom talk to one another. But they come together for his graduation. They think it would be kind of a good thing, and they think it's just gonna be a celebration, and it actually turns into a counseling session. And so I'm gonna give you about five minutes of a real light uh, segment here to take a look at what a dysfunctional family looks like. Take a look at this. Rebecca, do you have an opinion about your husband's alcoholism? Did you ever talk to your children about their father being an addict? Did you ever warn them that they would have the gene. Uh, my, my children lost their father when they were 17. They didn't have their father at their high school graduation. Randall didn't have his father when his children were born. Kate will not have her father at her wedding. So they had 17 years of memories, and that's it. There won't be any new ones for the rest of their lives. So, no, no, I did not sit them down and color their memories of their father by talking about the one part of him that wasn't perfect. And you really do a disservice by calling my husband an addict because he was so much more than that. Thank you. It's interesting that you bring up examples of Kate and Randall, but not Kevin. What? Kate not having her father at her wedding and Randall not having his father when his children were born. Yes, because those were just the first two examples that came to my mind. But don't you find it interesting that you have specific examples for your other children, but not Kevin? I don't. 
I don't find it interesting. I find it typical, to be honest with you. I mean, this is what we talk enough. about. Mom, enough. Enough. You don't have to lay into her. Okay, here we go. Yeah, here we go is right. Look, I, I've tried to empathize with you, Kevin. I really have. Okay, I've held my tongue. I've held my tongue while you've whined about your childhood. A childhood which I was there for, by the way, which I bore witness to. Your football tosses on the lawn with dad. Your tummy rubs from mom when you had a fever. See, Barbara may not have been there, but I was there. So don't you dare try to pull that same lame piece of wool over my eyes, bro. I've held my tongue, but I will not hold my tongue while you go after our mother for not parenting. I'm not going mother. after our mother, Randall. Why do you always twist things around He's like that? He's not, I'm not twisting going anything, Kevin. He's simply defending me. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mom. You're right. I'm sorry. Why don't you take his side? Because that's what I am not taking anybody's side. Hey, you want to talk about your tortured it's... childhood? Huh? You want to compare baggage? Randall, <laughs> let's Randall, do that. Randall, no, I would never guys, compare my tortured Kevin. childhood with yours, Randall, because I wasn't abandoned or adopted no. or I didn't have anxiety or I'm not a genius. No, you're Kevin. definitely not that, Kevin. You know what else you're not? You're not an addict, okay? The only thing that you're addicted to is attention. I mean, what happened, Kev? Your movie wrapped, you weren't rolling with Sly and Ron Howard anymore. Nobody was looking at you. So you had to get us all up here. All eyes on you, Q drug problem. Okay. Okay, Kev. <sighs> okay, guys. No, you know so what? I, I just, I'm, I want to know your thoughts on this, Randall. Why do you think your daughter was hiding in my car? Why do you think your daughter was hiding in my car. Have you ever thought about that? What about it? She was avoiding the Randall Show. Don't you dare No, no, talk welcome about to the Randall, Randall Show, Randall. ladies Kevin, and gentlemen. Kevin. Adopted by white people, two dads. Does it get any more interesting than that? Well, not for Randall. So you, you move your dying father into your home without thinking about what your wife or what your kids think of that, and then you bring some, some strange girl into the house after he dies, right? And the only person sitting there that no one's paying attention to is your daughter, Tess. You know what? I'm done, man. No. Randall, I'm Randall, done. Thank Randall. you, Randall, out the door. Cue mom chasing her favorite son. This is no. such a predictable movie. You are so predictable. You raise your voice hey, to her hey, one more hey. time. All your children Randall, you love equally, fine. right? That's yes. what you keep saying. Do you love yeah, all I'm my sure children the same? Wouldn't it feel refreshing, though, just to right here in this forum, because this is where you do that kind of stuff, to just tell everyone the truth, which is that you love Randall the most. Oh, He's your favorite, right? that's not true, right? Kevin. It's not true. That's absolutely it's ridiculous. I'm not going to say that, Kevin. Any one thing that you and I have. One thing that you and I have that is special, that is just you and me. Not, not, not all of us, not me and Randall, not me and Kate. Kevin, can you please stop? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm flustered and it's not kind of you well, what you're doing. Well, just admit that you love Randall more. We can stop pretending to be no, this No, he was just family. easier! He was easier and he didn't recoil when I touched him and he wasn't some sullen teenager who was angry at me for no reason and he didn't... <laughs> abandoned me and move away after his father died. Cue the music. Let's go to commercial. Something soft and fluffy. Maybe a puppy or a kitten. Maybe some Charmin toilet paper. Okay, that's kind of... So, so that's pretty heavy. That's as heavy as it gets. Let's talk about that a little bit. And let's talk about a biblical family. And let's talk about you. So five dysfunctions of a family. Here's the first one. Uh, is favoritism, favoritism. We just saw that. Uh, one, it, it, and it begins innocently. I don't think any parent ever goes, well, I'm just gonna like this child more than the others. Uh, it, it, one child, maybe like the mother here, you're just, he was easier. Every time I tried to approach you, you pushed me off when you were a teenager. He was easier. Or maybe one child needs more of your attention uh, in this series you'll find that the father, Jack, uh, was drawn, his heart was drawn to Kate, who had weight issues and needs her father's attention, and so uh, he really was drawn there. Rebecca's drawn to Randall because he's different, he gets picked on, and Kevin gets left out. And as a result, he acts out, and uh, we see that take place in the whole, in the whole uh, uh, series. Maybe one child captures your heart because they're an underdog. So let me ask you a question. Let's get personal. Who was the favored child in your family? This is so much fun to talk about at Thanksgiving, okay? Um, my family has had this conversation many, many times that I mentioned were dysfunctional. Now, I'm talking about the family where I have siblings, okay? And they would question the fact where I actually acknowledge siblings. In fact, my, 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 my siblings have said, you were the favored child. 
In fact, they said we had two favored childs in our family. I was the oldest, then I had a, a brother, Chris, that was 10 years younger than anybody. He was kind of one of those, oh, here's a surprise. And, um, and so they said we had two only childs in our family. We had four kids, but two of you were special, and the other two weren't as much. And, and I think that's okay. Uh, you know, I... Uh, <laughs> We have fun with it. We, we kind of work through it, but it can be an issue. So, uh, so let's, let's look at a biblical family where we see some of these type, type things. Here's what I did. I just Googled dysfunctional biblical families. I wanted to see if they're, I could just choose one of them. And uh, they're all dysfunctional. Every one of them. I mean, Adam and Eve, you know, first family, four kids, and one of them kills the other one, you know. Uh, you go all the way through, all the way through dysfunctional families. One I landed on was uh, the son of Abraham, and his name is Isaac. Remember Isaac? Abraham was gonna sacrifice Isaac, he didn't. Uh, that, that could cause childhood drama right there. But uh, Isaac has this wonderful uh, courtship of Rebecca, and it's just one of the most beautiful things uh, in the Bible, really, if you, if you study it. Some of you are going through the Bible right now, and maybe you've just read about that. But um, they get married, and Rebecca has fertility issues. And it, we find it in Genesis chapter 25, verse 21. It says, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife. I love that verse. I get a little weepy uh, uh, when, I, when I read that, thinking about a guy that loves his wife so much that he pleads to the Lord on her behalf. Because she was unable to have children, the Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebecca became pregnant with twins. Any of you ever had that happen? And uh, now we've got uh, a double challenge. It says, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. So they're, they're just opposite as can be. Isaac, the father, loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. He was, he was drawn to his oldest, I, they're twins, but uh, Esau was firstborn. And Isaac's drawn to him, maybe because he's more like me, or he'll go with me when I go and do these things, and, and Jacob just wants to stay home, and so he's, he's, he, he's drawn to him. He loved him, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Why? Maybe he was more like her. Maybe he was just kind of the underdog. I don't know what it was, but what I do know is that it's totally dysfunctional. These family coalitions weren't healthy. Rebecca and Isaac should have been aligned and working together for the best interest of the family and both sons, but they don't. And here's what happens. You know, you can just say, well, we're all dysfunctional, and we are. But if we don't deal with it, we pass it down to our children, and it wreaks havoc for generations. And you see that in this family. This particular dysfunction, this favoritism, was passed down by Jacob to his son. Anybody remember who Jacob's son was? Joseph. What do you know about Joseph, the story of Joseph and all of his brothers? Joseph has a dream. Dad buys him this awesome coat, but he doesn't buy anybody else anything. Because dad loved Joseph more than he loved the other. And it, it totally destroyed the family. And so uh, dysfunction, while we kind of laugh about it, if we don't deal with it, then we're gonna pass it down to our kids and our grandkids, and we'll see how that kind of stopped in this family over time. So the first dysfunction is uh, favoritism. The second one is deception, deception. And when there's deception, there's an elephant in the room that nobody can talk about. Sometimes some of us wanna talk about it, but we can't. It's a family secret. People pretend, nobody talks. Instead, they close the ranks and do everything that they can to keep up this untarnished family image, and it becomes a secret. In the show This Is Us, the secret is Jack is an incredible father. He, uh, like I mentioned earlier, he makes most of us fathers kind of feel like, man, I wish I would have said that. If you had writers in Hollywood writing for you, you could say the sensitive things he does. That's how I justify it in my mind. <laughs> but the truth is, and it's a truth that gets buried, and you saw it in the clip, Jack has an addiction issue. He's an alcoholic. Mama doesn't want to talk about it. Kevin co finally comes to grips with the fact that his dad was an alcoholic, his grandfather was an alcoholic, and now he has addiction issues, and his brother looks him square in the face and says, you're not an addict. He's, he's kind of in denial about the whole thing, and when Kevin tries to talk about it, 
the family circles up and, and uh, it, it just goes crazy. It's a family secret. Now, in the biblical family, the deception is everywhere. I mean, if you know anything about the story of Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Esau, you know, there's, there's this deception that we'll read about in a few minutes of, uh, uh, of, of getting the older child's blessing on the younger child. Mom is implicit in the whole thing. She kind of comes up with this scheme. Uh, you've got uh, Jacob, whose name is Supplanter, which literally means deceptive. He goes off to his uncle Laban. His uncle Laban deceives him. Jacob deceives his uncle. It's, it's crazy. It's just deception everywhere. And the question is, where did it start? Where did it start? This is interesting. It says Genesis 26 says, a severe famine now struck the land as it happened before in Abraham's time. Remember, Abraham is Isaac's dad. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. Okay, he's in a foreign land. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will what? I will be with you, and I will bless you. So God's giving him specific instructions. Don't go to Egypt. You're in the right place right now. Don't worry about being a foreigner. Just live as a foreigner in the land, and I'm gonna take care of you. I will, I will uh, be with you, and I will bless you. And so I hereby confirm that I will give all of these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly promised to Abraham. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, on and on and on, and every nation will be blessed. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar, okay? God promised, I'm gonna bless you, and Isaac stays there. But we have a problem right away. Verse 26, uh, verse seven, it says, when the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebekah, he said, oh, she's my sister. He was afraid to say, she's my wife, because he thought, they're gonna kill me to get to her because she's so beautiful. Where have you heard that story before? Abraham, his dad. If you go back and see the story of Abraham, exact same thing. So there's some deception in Abraham that's passed down to Isaac. Now, watch what it does to the family. Whoop, here we go. Wow, let's go back. Says, uh, he thought they'll kill me. She's beautiful. But sometime later, Abimelech, who's king of the Philistines, looked out of his window and saw Isaac caress and Rebecca. He says, that ain't how a guy does with his sister, okay? <laughs> we have a problem here. You can go and read the story. Causes a problem. But here's the point that I wanted to make. Look at this. Where's it at? But sometime later. How much later? How much later? I don't know. Could have been days. Could have been weeks. Could have been years. But during that space, these two young boys growing up, have a family secret. They can't tell anybody. Abraham brings them in and says, she's your mama, but we gotta pretend like she's not my wife. They go to school, people say, is that, what, what, and they can't talk about it, and it's a family secret that causes dysfunction. For you, do you have family secrets? Um, your secret might be keeping up an image that just isn't true. It might be a financial image. You know, things are tough, things have been better, and uh, you're keeping up an image and, and you tell the kids, you know, don't tell this, don't say this, da 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 all that kind of thing. And we've gotta have an image of somebody that we're not. I know, I know friends who, um, in their family, it was marriage. Um, you know, they're so concerned about what the, the church is gonna think, what the religious community's gonna think. Mom and dad's gotta have a happy marriage, and mom and dad not only didn't have a happy marriage, they're separated. And the kids can't tell anybody because we've got to keep up this image. What does that do to the family? It brings incredible dysfunction. The truth is, as long as you're propping up an image, it'll never get healed. A recovery maxim is you're only as sick as your secrets, and that's true. So the first dysfunction is favoritism. Second is deception. Third one is control. Now, I've got five of them. I don't have time to put a lot of time into each one of them. We'll just kind of breeze through this one a little bit. That's when one or both parents dominate, make decisions on behalf of their kids, even when it's unnecessary. And I hear this. I've been, you know, been doing this for a long time, and, and you've got a really controlling family, and, and thinking they're doing it for all the right reasons. And then you have a teenager or a college student that makes 
crazy decisions. And the parents wonder, why is that going on? And sometimes it's because we never let them make decisions as they were growing up. We didn't teach them how to, how to, make, how to make reasonable choices. Control is really a boundaries issue. And uh, there's a scripture, Bible talks about it, Ephesians 6, 4. It says fathers, because a lot of times this is a daddy issue. You've got a, a, a father with an anger issue, and he controls the family with anger. It says fathers, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. It says rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, the control issues in the... the um, a Pearson family and in the biblical family are probably more on mom's side. And it, it can go either way. But that's one of the issues of uh, dysfunction. Here's another one. Inability to resolve conflict. Did we see that in the video clip? Inability to resolve conflict. Conflict is normal in any family or any relationship. If you're not having conflict, you're probably not doing something right. And somebody goes, we're doing a lot right. I'm mean, you know, we're just... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's normal. Somebody's gonna do something or say something that's gonna stir it up. Do we have any testimonies on that? Okay, all right, we, know, we didn't know it's normal. What makes it dysfunctional or functional is how does it get resolved? Ephesians 4, and I taught on this a couple of weeks ago. I'm not gonna teach on it, but this is just kind of the, um, the blueprint for uh, conflict resolution. It says, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors or families the truth we're all, we're all parts of the same body or family, okay? So let's tell the truth. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. And the point is, we're gonna have anger. You should, you get mad about stuff. Families should argue a little bit, okay? They should. When I do premarital counseling, I don't do it anymore, I used to do it for years. I'd have a couple come in, I'd say, uh, give me like two or three of your best fights over the last few months. Well, we don't have any. So I try to provoke one. Because we, <laughs> seriously, seriously. Because, because you need to learn how to do um, uh, conflict resolution. You don't let it control you. You don't let the sun go down while you're angry because it gives the devil a foothold. And so, and so you, you, you know, you wanna learn how to, how to communicate. Uh, how do you resolve conflict in your family, how do you do that? Uh, wow, recently I watched my family start to unravel before my eyes on a group text. This was interesting, this was just about a week ago, two weeks ago, it's on a Friday morning, we don't get around real early on Friday, it's my Sabbath day off. All of a sudden my phone starts dinging, you have that ding, 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 ding. So I, Debbie and I both get our phones, you know, and we're, we're lo looking at them and, and, uh, and there's, there's war going on in the Surratt household. Uh, which was started by, uh, I won't mention any names, but your, your lead pastor was the first <laughs> room. And he wasn't actually communicating on behalf of himself. He was communicating on behalf of some other people in his immediate family, which is never healthy. And uh, so, so that individual and another individual started uh, firing missiles at one another. And then everybody jumps on uh, in sides and I'm going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Our family is, is gone. And I've got, I fix things. That's what I do. I fix things. Guys, anybody else like me? I fix things. And so I told Debbie, I said, I'm gonna jump on and fix this. She says, wait, 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 wait. Let's see how they do. See how they do. And so pretty soon, two truth tellers. I'm not saying there are other liars. No. <laughs> but do you have people in your family that they love truth? Well, we got a couple of them, and, and the two truth tellers were going at one another, and so suddenly we don't hear anything. They go offline, pull off the gloves, and go after it. Come back online and say, we love each other. We have a new you know, realization of what this, and they still didn't agree totally on the issues, but you know what? They did it right. They didn't let uh, anger control them. They didn't let the sun go down on their wrath, and they didn't give the, a foothold to the devil in our family. And so I was, I was proud of them, uh, totally scared there for a minute that uh, it wouldn't work, but it did. Okay, so here we go. And the fifth one is broken relationships. That's usually what is kind of the end of the, of the chain. One of the common ways of dealing with conflict is to cut off a family member. Uh, even when a relationship isn't physically cut off, there are lots of barriers between people. Intimacy is affected. Let me ask you a question. Can I meddle here just a minute? Do you have a family member that you don't speak to? 
Do you have a family member that you avoid? I know there are, there are safety issues, boundary issues, and all of that. But a lot of times we're very quick to cut off a family member. Uh, and this is us. Uh, it happens very, very quickly. The, the, the different ones react differently to the father and husband's death. But the common response is they turn on each other and they live separate, empty lives. In the biblical family, the tension starts to rise when the boys start getting married. At the age of 40, Esau married two Hittite women, Judith, the daughter of Barry, and Basemath, who had an unfortunate name, the daughter of Elon. <laughs> yeah, whoa. But Esau's wife, wives, that's part of the problem. <laughs> you say, why, why could they have more than one wife and we can't? You don't. You don't want to go there, okay? <laughs> or husbands, whatever it happens to be. Made life miserable for Isaac and Rebecca. You talk about in-law problems, they have in-law problems. And then the boys get at it, and there's some deception, and Jacob steals Isaac's birthright and said, from that time on, Isaac hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing, and Esau began a scheme. I soon will be mourning my father's death, and then I'm gonna kill my brother. That's just wonderful, good stuff but it's all, all through the Bible. Okay, so there's some dysfunctions. You go, hey, we have about four out of the five. What do we do? Well, what does a functional family look like? Well, I don't think there are, but I'm gonna call them good enough families. Okay, good enough families. What does a good enough family look like? Uh, the, the, in a good enough family, people feel loved, they feel valued, they feel recognized, they feel appreciated. They're not perfect, but they're safe. They're safe. Okay, uh, parents ensure that they create, and maintain an environment where family members are physically and emotionally safe. They don't let the kids run out in traffic, play with matches, put their hands on hot stoves or swallow Tide detergent uh, pellets. <laughs> and they protect them from dangerous people but not so overprotective that everybody feels smothered. And then secondly, they're open, they're open. Families can talk, they can share opinions, they don't have to agree on everything. They can argue without losing control. Parents teach their kids through conflict resolution what it means to be angry and not sin. It's okay to be angry. It's okay. But in our family, we're not gonna call names. We're not gonna have yelling. There'll be no physical violence. We're not gonna touch one another. But we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna learn to deal with conflict. And if we create that kind of environment, we serve our children uh, well and our future grandchildren well. Okay, so... Let me just real quickly give you next steps. And can, whenever I say next steps, so someone pointed something out to me the other day after a first Wednesday that I thought was profound. It was actually Mac Lake that did it. Uh, he said, you know, next steps are often clumsy. Would you agree with that? Do you remember when your kids or nephews or nieces or whatever first started to learn how to walk? Was it real strong at first? No, it's clumsy. So we've gotta be willing to take clumsy next steps. Here's the first one. Just admit your brokenness. Just, just, just get to a point that you can admit that it's okay to not be okay. None of us are perfect. In fact, the Bible says it like this. If we claim to have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. What did we say earlier? You're only as sick as your secrets. But look what the Bible also says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to do what? To cleanse our families. To cleanse us and our families from all of the wickedness that comes with the dysfunction that's not dealt with, okay? So just admit it. I'm controlling. I'm an alcoholic. I have issues with favoritism. I get angry and it gets nasty. Just admit it, just admit your brokenness. We're all broken. Second thing you do is ask God for his help and his direction. Just ask God, I love this, I love this verse, I love this verse. It says, he will rescue the poor. That's what God does. God doesn't go, I told you so, or let, let, me, let me give you some time in a timeout box. No, God rescues the poor when they cry to him. He will help the oppressed. And we're all oppressed by the enemy who have no one to defend them. He feels pity for the weak and the needy and, and he will rescue them. 
okay? So just ask God. God, and a lot of, he, he may lead you to people. He may lead you to a counselor. He may lead you to some books. He may lead you to a small group. But just, just ask God for his help and his direction. And here's the third one. Next, next step. Uh, yeah, that was a good scripture too. What is your next step? Get around people that appear to be doing family well. Just get around some people that appear to be doing. Now, they're not putting up an image, but you can kind of be around and go, you know, I think they're doing okay. They got issues, but they seem to be handling, especially the ones that I have. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 11, verse one. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You just need to find some people that, you know, um, they seem to be uh, following Christ in the area of their family, and, and then just stalk them a little bit, okay? Just stalk them a little bit. What I wouldn't do is I wouldn't just pour it all out on the first time you're around them. You don't even have to tell them what you're doing, okay? You don't, you know, just have dinner or kind of, hey, can I sit with you guys here? And if it gets creepy, you'll want to open up a little bit. But here's what I think. I guarantee you that if you hang around people who are a little bit healthier than you are, you're gonna get healthier even if you don't do anything else. So just hang around some healthy people, all right? So here's the challenge. I challenge everybody in here. We all said we're dysfunctional in some way. I challenge you to be the person that breaks the cycle because you can break the cycle. It's interesting is on the television show, the one I least, it was least likely to me to begin breaking the cycle is breaking the cycle. It's Kevin, it's Kevin. And, uh, and, and he's, he's, he's finding some wholeness. And, and what's interesting is as he changes, everybody else changes. They have to. Can't stay the same. In the biblical family, the cycle honestly isn't broken until Isaac's grandson, Joseph, steps up to the scene. And for some of us, we're dealing with issues that go back to our parents or our grandparents or our great-grandparents. You have the opportunity to pave the way to a better future. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the truth of your word. I thank you for contemporary examples of how your word is uh, so powerful and so clear. So God, I pray in the next few minutes that as we seek you, that your kingdom would come in our lives, and that your will would be done among us. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.